challenge to dignity. Our goal was to link academics, activists, and agencies concerned with the health of refugees and asylum seekers in a spirit of collaboration and comparison, bringing together professionals working with different populations of forcibly displaced peoples, ethnic groups, and nations. The video you are watching will contain an individual presentation edited to stand alone. We hope you find them to be of value. Our next speaker is Professor Derek Silov, who's Emeritus Professor at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. He's worked with refugees, asylum seekers, and other social, socially disadvantaged communities for over 40 years in research, clinical work, training, and development. His topic is adapting to mass trauma and displacement, testing and implementing the ADAPT model. Uh, yes, good, good morning on my side anyway, uh, and good afternoon on yours. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear. And see me, because I'm not sure I can see you. But uh, in any event, I'll, I'll get started. And um, greetings from Australia. Um, and uh, I'm really very pleased to be with you all. Um, apparently, you cannot see me. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think you're coming. Will you, do you want to turn on your video, Dr. Silov? I'm trying to, and uh, nothing's happening. I'm not uh, sure. The, the bottom left, uh, do, uh, did you take it off? Did you put it on video, the bottom left? Have you seen me at all? As, um, I'm if, you the, if you go to the start video icon at the bottom left, that should uh, yeah. do it. Yeah. I have clicked on it, but it says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Oh. Okay, so that's the ticket. Okay. You'll have it worked out in a flash, Derek. Okay, no, that's okay. Shall I get going anyway, or? Uh, no, give, give us uh, one second. We're making you host so that you could turn on your video. Sorry, apologies. Okay, no, that's it. It says make host. You didn't see it. Go back. I saw make host. Alexis. I got it. No worries. It says make host. Uh, Dr. Silo, are you still there? There he is, right there at that, that icon, right there. He was there. Oh. There he is, right? Yep. Dr. Silo, will you please try again to share your video? Can you hear me? Now I can hear you. I can see you. The room can see you. Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, it must be the distance over the Pacific or something. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I'm very pleased to be here, and I, I, I'm very grateful to uh, Thomas for inviting me. And uh, it's wonderful to hear that our Institute of Global Health is taking <coughs> this area of work so seriously. Um, not many are, and, and I really congratulate you on that. Mm -hmm. And I'm also pleased to hear that Peter was uh, preceded me because a lot of the work we have done recently has been with Peter and uh, it couldn't have gone ahead without him. So I'd just like to acknowledge uh, his enormous help over recent times. So what I'd like to do is just rush through in the short time we have uh, the background experience we've had with asylum seekers in Australia, and also then introduce you to the ADAPT model and give you some brief outline of the model as well as um, 
the new therapy that we've we've uh, developed in relation to that model. So if I could have the next slide, please. I mean, I think you probably covered this in, in your discussions to date, um, but when we first started in the field, when I first started in the 1980s, we sort of inherited the trauma arrow PTSD model from psychiatric traumatology and very soon realized that um, it was inadequate for the field that we're in. That's not to say it's not relevant, but then it's a very long discussion about that. I, I don't reject the notion of trauma or of PTSD impact at all, but it's only one uh, small component of the work we do, as we well know, that we do have to consider a whole range of other issues with asylum seekers and refugees, including all of those listed on, uh, on the screen. And I covered that uh, originally in my article many years ago in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease which was really the uh, initiating thoughts that led to the ADAPT model in the first place. Next slide, please. Um, I mean, for myself working in the field in Australia, just to give you a very quick bit of history, um, I was shocked to find asylum seekers being held in detention. And, uh, you know, this was after working with government for a long time in the refugee area. And that, uh, you know, when Australia was quite benevolent and helped set up centers around the country and we were working hand in glove with government at the time. And then suddenly this specter arose of asylum seekers being held in detention. So I had this weird experience of working in a well-established torture and trauma service, treating refugees and then 10 minutes down the road, I would go to the detention center and find their compatriots with exactly the same histories held in prison-like conditions um, for no uh, reason other than the way they had entered the country, which uh, according to government was unauthorized. Of course, we know that refugees have a right to seek asylum and I've never understood the notion that it's illegal to do so. So I suddenly caught, and many of my colleagues with me, in this bizarre situation of treating two identical populations under extremely different conditions, one very welcoming and the other uh, harsh and uh, deterrent. Um, asylum seekers in the community were living under severe restrictions in relation to work, in, uh, income, um, English language classes, training, and so on. Uh, they were being subjected to testing and stressful determination procedures. <coughs> uh, they had, uh, they were placed under prohibitions in terms of family reunion or right to leave country if their family were ill or in desperate need. And some of them were for rather arbitrary reasons held in detention often for prolonged periods of time under prison-like conditions, including then in remote um, areas of our country, which as you know is huge. And so in the middle of the desert, there would be a detention center holding asylum seekers. And increasingly, we discovered that children were being held in these facilities. Now, all of that is familiar to you now because we were the kind of the forerunner of this policy, sadly, in our country. Um, and I covered that early history with Charles Waters, actually, who I see is also at the conference in that paper that I've listed at the bottom. Next slide, please. So that's just one of the many awful pictures of, of a child in detention in our country. Next slide, please. So we decided because uh, the government kept insisting that there was no <clears throat> no systematic evidence that holding people in detention or under restrictive conditions in the community was uh, impacting negatively on their mental health. This was a constant refrain that we were exposed to. We started to undertake the first research in this country and, and in some senses in the world on the specific mental health of asylum seekers 
and especially focusing on their post-migration living difficulties, which was in a sense an expansion of the existing trauma model, which tended to refer back to human rights violations in the country of origin in relation to the causation of their mental health problems. So this was uh, a study uh, just looking at all the <coughs> factors that impacted on anxiety and depression, PTSD in particular. And while the number of trauma experiences in the home country was significant, so were all these other post-migration stresses and deprivations, which again, you are quite familiar with. But this was just one of the early studies showing systematically that this in fact was the case. Next slide, please. Uh, we also followed up some uh, a group of asylum seekers under temporary protection, it was called in Australia, Australia TPBs, um, and looked at the longer term effects of living under these conditions. Next slide, please. <coughs> And this just shows the difference between those on permanent residency and those on temporary protection. The temporary protection visa holders are in pink. And just to rush through these slides quickly, uh, you'll see that there's a huge difference, of course, between the two in all respects. Um, but overall, there was an increase in problems in asylum seekers over time whereas permanent residents had a decrease in problems over time, as you would expect. PTSD was so high in the asylum seekers that uh, it remained static in that it had reached the ceiling effect, if you like, whereas anxiety increased, depression increased, general health uh, symptoms increased in comparison to their compatriots from uh, much the same countries who were granted permanent residency. Next slide, please. Similarly, when we looked at more general issues of worry uh, about residency status, living difficulties as a whole, uh, social coping and English proficiency, you can see again, always in the negative for those on temporary protection over a two year period. Next slide, please. <coughs> We tried for many years to get permission to interview asylum seekers in detention, especially again because of this claim that there was no evidence that it was doing any mental health harm. This was denied us repeatedly by government or just uh, evaded. The requests were just left to lie on tables of bureaucrats and so on. Interestingly, a view. Um, a family in a retention um, um, in in Australia, and this is just a group of people whom I work with um, who took a strong lead in this research. Next slide, please. And these essentially were uh, the findings. We interviewed ten families by phone. Interestingly, they were allowed to. Uh, phone us and we were allowed to find them. Uh, so these were 14 adults and 20 children. All the adults and all the children meant, met diagnostic criteria for at least one psychiatric disorder. And many of them met criteria for multiple psychiatric disorders. And if you compared that with their histories, there was a multifold increase in mental disorder and problems since being in, det in detention. And most strikingly, the, deta uh, the detainees um, described exposure to multiple forms of trauma within the uh, detention center itself. Uh, and that's listed uh, below uh, all the awful experiences they were, were exposed to while in detention. And some of these uh, violent protests and so on you know, gain public attention and, and cause great contra controversy in our country at the time. Next slide, please. So really, I, I guess we were all trying to work out and I was especially preoccupied with, you know, what kind of overarching psychosocial stroke mental health model would accommodate uh, our observations amongst these 
people who were exposed to such complex forms of human rights violations, trauma and deprivations. And that's helped me in a sense to develop uh, what I've subsequently called the ADAPT model. Next slide, please. So that stands for adaptation and development of the persecution and trauma. And essentially I, uh, you know, through a process of experience and interaction with colleagues and of course with our um, beneficiaries, I sort of felt that we could organize our very complex thinking under five psychosocial pillars, which are really in a sense, the foundations that we all depend on in our society, within our institutions and the way society is organized to provide us with the foundations for sound mental health. And that is the issues of safety and security, uh, attachment bonding and networks, justice, identity roles, and the capacity to live a life which has coherence and meaning. And all those arrows just point to the final pathways that can eventuate in people where these pillars of society, these institutions of society are grossly undermined. That's not to uh, indicate that it's a kind of deterministic, simple, simple relationship. There are many steps between the undermining of safety and security and uh, the expression of PTSD and anxiety and so on. And there are many uh, areas of potential resiliency and adaptation that can take place to actually avoid those outcomes. So this is a, a simplistic model and it doesn't show the intervening steps that either strengthen or weaken people's resiliency to these adverse outcomes. Next slide, please. So this is just another depiction of the model. Those are the, the pillars in the middle and, and these pillars obviously relate to a number of uh, and derive from a number of disciplines and, and uh, systems of thinking, human rights, clinical traumatology, community recovery and development amongst many others, of course. Next slide, please. Just to underline some of the principles um, that under that uh, underpin the ADAPT model, um, there are many, but these are some of them that are relevant to asylum seekers. That is, for asylum seekers, the key psychosocial pillars and foundations of society that in normal circumstances support health and psychosocial well-being are simultaneously eroded. This undermining of social systems occurs throughout the course of the asylum process which is a continuous process of persecution, flight, dangerous journeys, temporary asylum and arrival in, in countries of asylum. The undermining of those psychosocial systems exacerbates effects of past human rights violations and ongoing stresses. So there's this complex compounding effect, which of course is not easy to capture using ordinary um, research methods because of this complex compounding effect. And I think of interest is that the intrapsychic and behavioral responses that we often see in asylum seekers um, mirror and interact with the eroded external psychosocial systems. So they actually make sense. They're not uh, bizarre that someone who experiences uh, constant affront to their dignity, to their sense of justice, develop problems with managing anger, people have uh, loss and bond disruption, end up with grief reactions of various types and so on. So, so the reactions themselves are not just some uh, diagnosis in a uh, classification system, but really make sense in terms of their experiences. Now, uh, next slide please. So if we can just stop there, um, so if we just ignore the ADAPT side of it, the model that you've got on your screen is essentially the standard PTSD model that many traumatologists have worked with for years, which is pre-existing pre trauma, ongoing adversity leads to PTSD and results in functional impairment. 
And in a sense, the ADAPT model then extends that. Let me just continue with that slide, please. If we could just uh, tip, uh, tap on, on the rest of that, please. Just keep going. So, so this is this is a, the expanded model, and it's actually based. Uh, what I'm showing is based on an empirical study of a group of um, asylum seekers to show that, in fact, the ad adapt uh, pillars interact with and uh, compound the existing trauma model. That's the only message I want to get across because it's too complex to go through them model in detail, but the broken lines or the indirect effects and the uh, continuous lines or direct effects, but it just shows that at all levels, the ADAPT pillars interact with and compound the standard trauma model. Next slide, please. Two minutes left, Eric. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear that. Two minutes left. Okay, so I'll go through this very quickly. This has led us to developing the integrated ADAPT therapy um, program. And I, I must acknowledge Alvin Tay, who's my colleague who's been very active in this. Uh, we essentially have developed a brief psychotherapy, uh, which Peter van der Vogel has helped greatly in, in um, testing based on the ADAPT model. Next slide, please. Nick, uh, it's a very complex set of uh, procedures, which is sort of outlined in step form here, and which I won't have time to go into, but just to show that there are uh, many steps in the process, uh, but heavily focused on the ADAPT model. Next slide, please. We use a whole lot of different uh, simple methodologies to assist participants um, understand and 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 uh, interact with the ADAPT model. Next slide, please. And then next slide again. And there's been extensive background work uh, as listed yeah, in the development of, of the program and work especially with uh, Myanmar refugees, the Rohingya, Chin and Kachin. Uh, and we've been through a, a lot of cultural adaptation and ethnographic work in preparation and a lot of piloting. Next slide, please. These are some of the effect sizes in a RCT that we've completed and published, just to show you the impact of IAT on a range of outcomes including all the standard uh, psychiatric diagnoses, as you can see, PTSD, depression, and so on, but also on, on measures of the ADAPT uh, pillars themselves, which is included in the category of the ASI, which actually measures change in the perception and the impact of those experiences. And you'll see that secondary outcomes were also good, uh, generalized anxiety disorder and grief. Uh, and overall, the trend was for greater improvement with IAT in the immediate aftermath of treatment compared to just the standard CBT treatment, although the, the, the differences were slight, noting that, the, that both treatments were effective. Next slide, please. Okay, this is uh, really the final slide. And uh, just to say that again, with Peter's help at Cox's Bazaar, which I have never visited, I should admit, uh, and the work has really been done with Peter and uh, again, Alvin Tay, my colleague, and others on the ground, uh, obviously community workers and agencies at Cox's Bazaar. But this was more an implementation outcome study for group IAT. And the preliminary findings are showing rather large effect sizes for all outcomes. And this is in the midst of a rather unstable emergency situation. Um, as you know, in a, a, a fairly chaotic environment. Uh, so it's interesting that the therapy was still helpful to people within that situation. Okay, I know my time has run out, so I'll stop at that point. Thank you. Thank you. We have questions. 
Any questions from here in the room? Quick question. Teresa, yes. Yeah. Derek, thanks for an amazing talk and all that you're doing on these topics. Uh, I'm excited to see you working with the Rohingya too, and I'm going to put you in touch with some people. Uh, I wanted to ask your thoughts on what you think the mechanisms are by which being in detention uh, relates to greater mental distress. Is it actually detention or is it the uncertainty and the insecurity? So I'm thinking of the remain in Mexico policy in Title 42 in this country where uh, asylum seekers, you know, have to remain in this very insecure environment in Mexico. And I wonder about the ways in which that is a form of detention that's just as damaging for mental health and what your thoughts are on, is it detention per se, or is it insecurity and uncertainty? Because when you're in a facility, technically you're safe, but you don't know where you're going. You're in this interstitial space for a long time. The remain in Mexico policy in ways could be even more damaging. So I would just love your thoughts on that. What are the mechanisms here? Yeah, look, that's a fantastic question, and and it's it's worthy of uh, of further research, and I'd encourage you to do that because, um, I mean, we measured all the detention uh, related factors in in one of our several studies, uh, especially people who'd left detention, um, and you know they obviously the scores on those measures were very high, um, so it was a bit hard to you know, tease out which of those stressors made the difference because they were also highly correlated, really. But I mean, I think, as you say, conceptually, there are three things at least, if not more. The one is simply being held in detention and the uncertainties about the future uh, that go along with it. And just the, the, the pure issue of being confined, in, a, especially amongst people who've been confined previously. The second is conditions in the detention centre, which in Australia have been pretty harsh and, and terrifying for many people, which has included, you know, the treatment they received, uh, deprivations that they've experienced, and also uh, the disruptions that have occurred uh, through protests and people publicly committing suicide, for example, or harming themselves as, as a form of protest and so on. Uh, and, but the third, which I think is really critical and has come out more or less consistency, uh, consistently over time, is the length of detention. And I'd refer you to a paper which is in the Medical Journal of Australia by a, an inmate who was a doctor himself uh, from Iraq. Uh, and I just don't have it at my fingertips. But he described the from the inside the series of um, changes that he noted in himself and in others as time passed while in detention. And that's really worth reading. And I'll, I'll provide you with a reference if you, if you would like, because it shows how the time, uh, over time, how people lose hope. And in the end, some of them become virtually catatonic as all hope dissipates. I mean, we've had people in detention for up to seven years including children, actually, and adolescents. And many have ended up uh, on a hunger strike and, and so on because they've been so desperate. And it's, uh, I have to say, no fun managing people on hunger strike, especially young people, mm. would be in my experience. Anyway, that's a long-handed uh, account of what I'm saying, but I think it's worthy. Your question is very worthy, and, and it's really important if we accept that detention is going to happen and, and there's nothing much we can do about it, we need to at least think of ways to try to improve conditions and, and research in that area to tease these things out are really uh, would be really important. Thank you. Please do send that reference when you find it. I will, yes. Thank you very much, Derek. We appreciate your intervention.